All right, guys, here we are at it, back uh, again with another tape deck repair. This time, uh, I've got an Iowa. It has come from eBay, as generally all my stuff does. And this is in really nice condition, if I'm honest with you. Uh, it's an ADF500. Release date is about 1991, I believe. It's in its original box. It's, it's in its original packing and everything else. And... To be honest with you, it's just a nice looking deck and it's in real good shape as well. So I thought for the condition it's in, it's worth having a look at it. Uh, came off eBay, seller states that although it powers up, uh, the reels do not move, I think was his, his terminology. And uh, so we'll have a quick look around it, see what it's got, and then we'll open it up and see what the problems are. Uh, so this is two motor, two head, uh, early 90s. I'm not going to say... Bottom of the range, but it's also not top of the range. It's a reasonable, I think, mid-range, low to mid-range deck. Mid-range deck, let's go mid-range. Uh, Dolby BNC, HX Pro, uh, this AMTS, which I'll show you in a minute. It's got a couple of little features on the deck, which is quite nice. You've got a bias fine-tuning knob there. Um, you've also got a record calibration knob, which I'm not entirely sure what that's going to give me, uh, because it doesn't have automatic calibration on it. It also has, in relation to this bias knob as well, it has a little guide on the top. So you can do a search there, if I can just zoom in. You can do a search of whatever tape you have. And you know where to position the bias knob depending on what tape you're recording to. Oh no, I thought that was, that was quite snazzy actually. And it's good that it survived. I love little stickers like that. We've got uh, an amazing Made in Singapore, which is uh, obviously something to be proud of. And um, the only thing I have done is powered it up just to make sure that it did have power. You know, I use a test lamp and everything to make sure there's no shorts in it. But other than that, this is unboxed uh, today and we're going to have a look at it. So one thing I have noticed on this is this tape drawer is the beefiest tape drawer I've ever encountered. I mean, this thing is over an inch thick. <laughs> And it's something to do with the way that this uh, this modulation stabilizes. It's basically like a, a felt pad on the back. It's on a spring, and this is going to keep your tape nice and steady as you're playing it. So that's 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 quite nice actually, and it is absolutely huge. The transport's about a inch, inch and a half, maybe almost two inches back into the into the cassette deck. So um, so yeah, so I'm going to power it up and see what it does on camera. And then we'll open it up and see how we get from there. All this plastic is in real good condition, no scratches or anything. We'll give it the usual clean. Uh, even the gold around the phone's port hasn't gone all wrong. Um, that's not a button. Looks like a button, but it's not. And yeah, and then we'll see what we can do with it, play some tips and enjoy it for what it is. One thing I noticed is that on the, on the plug it says Iowa. Which, in my experience, when this happens, it means we've been sat on a stack or in a cabinet or something. And uh, that's a differentiate between four or five plugs. So that's a good sign. To me, that means it's been looked after. And that's probably why it's not absolute state. Right, so we've got some Bruce Springsteen to try in it. Because I'll be honest with you, I hate Bruce Springsteen. So uh, if this chews this tape, I ain't going to cry about it. So we have power. And... Uh, we've got VU meters on. Uh, the button shouldn't do anything because there's no tape in it. So let's fire a tape in it if I can just do it one handed. So when you shut this, this spring loaded, uh, it's a it's a box on a spring basically, but they decided to call it the uh, anti modulation tape stabilizer. I suppose everyone had to have a, a novelty, didn't they? Uh, what's unusual as well is it, it it's it's got two motors in it. Now what that's going to look like inside, I'm not sure, but um, you know we've got our Super DX Head Q View system, uh, music sensor. I presume means you can you can mess about with uh, uh, in, uh, skip between tracks when you're playing and things like that. And it's all full logic as well, so it's buttons, which I suppose by the late 80s, early 90s was normal. But uh, so we've got no indication of, of of tape type or anything. There we go. Sorry, uh, our Dolby. Yeah, a red light for C and a green light for B. Um, nothing on that one. Tape counter resets. That's good. All the knobs seem pretty fine. These are a bit tight, but they're all as tight as each other. So, uh, right, tape's in. 
and play. Nothing. That's interesting. So that thought it was playing. And then it just clicks off. Okay. We had a motor there. But nothing going. Nothing going there. Pause button works. Alright, so uh, completely dead. Nothing at all, which is unusual because you can usually hear the motor when it's playing. I'm not convinced it's doing anything. So uh, let's open it up and see what we have. So some of you might remember what I said about checking screws before you take them out and you can see if somebody's been in it. Well, this screw has definitely had somebody playing with it. It's all scratched and mashed. So we'll see. Another strange feature is we have a screw there with an indentation, but at the back we have an indentation but no screw. From factory, of course, but strange. Usually I would have videoed me taking it off, but honestly, that was absolute pain in the ass. These has got these weird clips that hold part of the lid in, instead of just sliding off, I don't know. Right, so, uh, <laughs> this issue straight away, so I've, I've literally just, I don't know what that is. That's just sat inside the chassis. I'm going to have to try and identify if that's even off this. But put that in there. Uh, somebody's been here, as you can tell. Uh, that, that is for here, I presume, with the... It's definitely got a bent pin on it as well, which would suggest potentially in a, um, a less professional touch, shall we say. Transport itself is quite unusual, really. Uh, as I say, it's got two motors. We have uh, a wire there actually missing completely. That is missing, I suggest, from one of these posts. Why that, why that would occur, I don't really know. Uh, looking down the transport, if you can see... Let me try and zoom out a little bit. Look at that circuit board on the back of the transport. The point of this circuit board here. It's actually beveled outwards like that. Uh, and it looks like it looks like it's actually touching the capstan down there. If I can get in, it is definitely rubbing on the capstan. So that's probably why it doesn't work. Belts, from what I can see, if I can, we have a, a red belt for some reason, which potentially could be a, uh, it's just in there. It could just be an elastic band, I suppose. Um, so there's a little bit of cleaning up from somebody else's attempts, I think. Somebody's maybe changed the belts on it and it's not done an amazing job. Uh, the, the tape select switches and the tape insert switches are in place. There's definitely an issue with the way that, that circuit board sat. Uh, but let's look at the positives. It's very clean. Um, I presume that they've had this transport out and then tried to fix it. It hasn't really worked and then just not bothered plugging it back in I don't know uh, this looks like a bit of a mess of wires but it's actually fine I'm pretty convinced that's factory power supply looks pretty straightforward um, direct to the power button so first things first I'm gonna get this transport out and we can get some belts ordered up maybe a pinch roller depending on what it looks like and once we've got it out I'll figure out why it looks like that mm, and then take it from there. I just noticed straight away there we are absolutely upside down, I'm afraid, guys, but uh, the that screw's missing. Hold the transport in. This screw's in place. We've got a belt on the counter, so that's, uh, that's a good sign, but yeah. I'm going to have to be. I think this is going to be a lesson in cleaning up somebody else's 
problems. Um, this is the old tape that would have potentially held some of the uh, yeah that that this board is is stuck on the capstan there. <laughs> I don't know how they managed that. It's quite impressive actually, but I would suggest that the transport's not gone together correctly and cause issues. So first things first, the main power cables and whatnot to the board is already disconnected. We'll sort out that pin and we're going to plug it back in. This data line to the front board. This looks like it's damaged, but I don't think it is. This data line can come out. So we'll unplug that and that frees the transport to move. And it looks like we've got one, what would be one, two, three, and I presume four screws to remove a transport. We'll see if we can take that tip, uh, the, uh, the door front off first. Right, so the door front is a standard slide up and off job. I've already unclicked it there, so uh, I'm really wary of breaking these because you're never going to find another one. So there's one bit, which now gives us enough room around there to be able to move the transport that way through the inside. And we can also unhook the counter. That belt is okay, sufficient. Might change it if I have a spare in the right size. I can just start taking out the screws that hold the transport in. That's actually looking to come out already, so um, we've got a replacement for the missing one. Same again, if I can actually get a camera in whilst we're moving. So it's this screw on the left, the right one seems to be for the, the mounting tray. Apologies for the focusing. So I'll take this one out and the same on the other side. So the one on the other side, if you can just see, is right at the back of the, the last gold screw. Uh, just let me try and move these wires out of the way a little bit. It is not easy to get to it. So on the left there, you've got the earth cable on the right and the one on the left. I've had to take the handle off the screwdriver in order to get it in. Uh, and we'll, I'll get that one out and hopefully the transport should be free. Now that is that is that is not an easy one to get out. I'll be honest with you. I get some tweezers in there and try and grab all of that screw because uh, no, oh, that's good. Uh, that access isn't amazing. Maybe they didn't want us to. Maybe they didn't want us to fix this one. I don't know. But that is from what I can see. That is all the transport screws out, and I'm hoping that this. Yeah, mm. maybe that frame needs to come out of the back as well. I was kind of hoping that this would lift. Yeah, I think we have to take the frame out as well with that earth cable on it. Yeah, so that's next. So these were, are in the plastic, which is, I never really like screws that go in the plastic because there is the danger of uh, stripping stripping out the hole and then you got to repair it and whatnot. But these, these are actually for, for plastic, these are actually quite fine threaded. I'm going to cheat on this one and just lift that out with the earth cable. There we go. There's that one. And then this, this one, if I can get a screwdriver onto the top of it and then someone will get that we really have limited room to get this one out. I mean, it's down to me. It's, it, <laughs> it's down to me to uh, possibly have a short screwdriver, but... Whew, in the process, I've just discharged all the caps across my little finger. Uh, <laughs> across those power terminals, which was quite nice. Uh, but, yeah, don't do that. That's not fun. All right, so that was extremely tight. I don't really understand why. There's potentially that whoever's done a repair on this in the past hasn't actually 
you can see the screw down the side there doesn't even look in place. Potentially whoever's done this in the past hasn't took the whole transport out to do a belt repair and instead they've done it in situ which is just going to make your life more difficult if you ask me. Alright, good stuff. So, let's see if we can get it out now. Uh, hopefully this is just going to... Yeah, I can just balance the top of it. Are we free? We're free. Okay. So just the movement of this this bracket, just that just that tiny bit, you know. Uh, it's actually still connected further down, but the just a little bit of movement allows you to get the the transport out completely. Doesn't include the door, which is quite interesting. The door is actually part of the front panel. Oh, let me just uh, flip this round. So the door remains part of the front panel, which is a bit different. And the transport itself is an absolute naked transport. Uh, the, the heads look in absolutely amazing condition. Um, let me try and zoom in a bit. It's in really good nick. Oh, uh, we've got a little bit of grease here and there. There's no dirt and everything else. So I'm going to go on the back of it. Belts all seem to look in place. So we'll get them off and have a look at the belts and see what we can clean up and try and get it working. All right, so I just noticed this is an absolute cork or someone has actually glued the belt back together as opposed to uh, replacing it. If you can just see there, this is glued together. Um, so, you know, potentially the uh, the speed's been adjusted to compensate, I'm not sure, but it's been a bit of a bodge job. Uh, we'll, uh, I would like to say a bit. This screw in the top here is off to one side and not actually in properly. So, what I want to do is I'm going to get this this motor. I'm trying to be very gentle with this. Uh, we need to remove this plate with the two motors on. And there's one, two, three, four, five screws. So once you get those screws out, I'll take the plate off and look at the belts and try and work out what's going on with it. Although the the belt is in place, this capstan is stuck. It won't turn at all, really. So. Something's not right on the rebuild, whoever's put it back together. Another screw that's off to one side. And the last one. There's this one on the side. Paying, tef paying pretty careful attention to not damaging these coils because this is your logic control so these, these coils will have pistons for play and stop and whatnot. But I believe that we should have... I'm trying to be very gentle with this because it's got no door on it it's difficult to work out how to lay it down. So all our screws are off but the wires are all soldered so perhaps these were desoldered and not put back on. I'm not sure. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So. As you can see, this was rubbing on this board. Now whether this capstan should be underneath the board, I'm not entirely sure. Or maybe there's a washer missing or something like that. It's in particularly reasonable condition. Nice heavy, nice heavy capstan though. With the two motors you should get a real low wow and flutter with it. Uh, there's our repaired belt. I commend his ability to repair a belt, you know, it's but... Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. And our other belt is this one. There is some remnants of old belt goo here as well. And you can see where the capstan's been rubbing on this circuit board. I just don't understand why it would be rubbing on the circuit board if it was uh, in the right position. This seems like it's this seems like it doesn't have anything else on it. Um, it's not missing anything. It's really clean. Maybe where it goes into that port there. Maybe it needs a plastic washer or something. There's a spacer. Uh, let's get this other red belt off, which seems odd that it's red. So as we look, if I can angle the light correctly, as we look down the back of this board, it's not actually seated correctly. So that seems like a pretty straightforward... It looks like actually some of the plastic tabs that retain it have been melted, maybe on purpose, you know, to keep it where it... Maybe you snap something off and... Uh, he or she are there, um, but it's not seated correctly, and that's the cause of the issues of playback. I think the belt, I mean, the belt should still work really, as knackered as it is. So, I'm trying to remove this circuit board. I need to anyway, in order to uh, to get that second belt off there. But it looks like some of the terminals have been melted. Sorry, the plastic. Um, push fit terminals have been melted right so I've been having a nosy about with this and the terminal board is soldered to all the switches the left and right coils and basically another switch there so all I can see sensibly from working out in my own mind uh, I'd have to desolder that board in order to get to the belt that goes around this pulley here. So I'm going to pull a service manual up. Usually you can just work these things out for yourself. I'm going to pull a service manual up to see what it says because I need to try and get behind it in order to remove that red belt and refit a new belt. And it seems excessive to have to desolder all that, but if that's what we need to do, that's what we need to do. Um, it's just not very service friendly. There is a distinct lack of grease on these components as well. So I'm going to pull the service manual up and see what it says. Alright, so here we are. I found the service manual. It was pretty straightforward to find. And you've got the usual electrical diagrams and whatnot. And we've got our exploded view of a transport. However, the exploded view of a transport is in the expected detail, but it doesn't include the circuit board. So to me, it looks like we're going to have to desolder that circuit board. I'm pretty confused as to how anybody's done a full belt on it in the past, which is maybe they haven't. That's also possibly an issue. But it'll also give us a chance to repair these tabs and make sure that circuit board's seated properly. So I'm going to desolder that now, I think. And uh, there's no mention of it uh, at all in any of the service documents. Uh, and as you can see there, this uh, there's, there's our coils and whatnot. Again, the circuit board isn't attached to it in the exploded diagrams. So it looks like we're doing some desoldering. So all we need to desolder from inspection is these uh, coil connectors on each side. The, the switches will be fine. They'll come off with the board. Uh, so it's these two over here and these two over here. Pretty straightforward, actually. My solder suck is a little bit violent actually, but that was fairly straightforward. So Underneath it should sit on these posts And I think that was the issue it should sit on there and it wasn't With underneath that clip lock And it just wasn't seated correctly, and that's why it was rubbing, but it now gives us the ability to remove this belt hopefully maybe 
first of all we've got to take this this uh, split or seal out if I can get it without damaging it these are the worst tweezers in the world just needed a little more a little more force than tweezers to get that out so I really don't want to lose that there we go so now hopefully this arm will lift and well, it seems to be underneath that one now I'll take this one off as well Mm. <laughs> that was that was really on there. That one's not split. That one's like a press washer. So keep that one as well. And this now should hopefully lift off and allow us to remove this belt. He says that is. In the middle of there. Maybe we can move the axle. Hmm. So this is kind of like a pinch roller. It's kind of held in place with an axle. But I'm very wary of breaking it. Because as with a lot of these tape decks, as soon as you break some of the actual transport components, all you've got left is replacement of the entire transport, which isn't useful at all but it's just that side of there we go okay so that belt is it's got remnants of old belt on it it's red which is unusual to me that's just an elastic band um but we've no doubt got a replacement for these two this is the, the counter belt which is pretty good I'm pretty sure I've got a replacement for it anyway this one is going to get replaced with a, the correct belt so now we've got some good old IPA it's a case of just giving some of this excessive grease a bit of a clean up just want rid of some of it not all of it because it's good grease seems like the correct lithium grease and then when we put the new belt on it's not just going to get covered in grease uh, and then we'll get in there and do the same with inside that roller as well. So it's just a case of going all the way around. Alright, so all cleaned up. Uh, new belt has been fed into this this arm. And we can stick that back where it was. And then we'll clean up the mortars separately. And the pulleys on the mortars are obviously part of that metal arm system, that are, uh, part of this. So we'll clean them up separately. But as long as this is on and that belt is in the right position. We should be good. All right, so our arm is on. Our little retaining washer is back on this. The the movement hasn't moved, so we should be good. And we've got this in a position where the belt is on, and it can be uh, moved to whatever pulley on the motor it needs to go to, which I believe is actually over here over here so uh, this side so the belt needs to be over there and we can position that a bit better when we need to um i think i might try and use one of these this to me looks like a pin that i can sit it on a little bit like on the sony transports it has some way you can sit it under tension to allow you to uh to put it where you need it to be. So let's see if we can manage that. Hmm. 
Hmm. Not one ended anyway. All right. All right. So <laughs> I've I've just sat it on this pin. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does. But we'll see where we get on. Right. So before I go about um, cleaning up the pulleys on the motors, I'm going to just resolder this wire in place. They look a bit rubbish, so I'm going to clip probably uh, that one as well, and then strip the wire back, resolder it. Strip this one back, resolder it, and then I'm just a bit more confident that it's not going to break every time I touch it. Right, so the belt that I took off the drive belt, laid flat, measures 95mm. Right, so a lot of people on audio camera and whatnot have stated that it's difficult to get drive belt kits for this, and it is actually. There's there's a couple in like somewhere stupid like Slovakia or Russia or somewhere, like that, and they're very expensive for a set of three belts. Um, I only need a one. Um, the one I replaced there was just part of a collection that I had, but I don't have any four mil flat drive belts. So what I'm going to do is, um, thinking back to when I was at school, so it's 95mm laid end to end, which makes it 190mm circumference, and I'm going to use uh, the equation to work out the diameter from that 190mm circumference, and then order one up, and see what comes. So, taking that into account and doing some quick maths on Google, because I'm lazy to write equations out, uh, we need a 60mm diameter belt, so deck tech stuff is what I like to use because well, I've never really had a problem with them and they're quick to deliver. And a diameter of 60mm for, well, that's a 5mm flat belt, but I'm not overly bothered about another mil. It will fit, let's just double check that it's going to fit before I go and buy it. As we're looking at this, uh, oh yeah, loads of room. So uh, yeah, five mil, six, uh, five mil flat be sixty mil, and that is four pound forty five. So let's buy that. Perfect. And that'll be in the next couple of days. So then we can get it back together. So while I'm waiting for the belt, I thought I'd resolder these contacts back on because now we've got this belt in place, we can put the the circuit board back in. And what they've done is when they'd reseated this circuit board and presumably resoldered these points, this black tab retains the circuit board. So when I stick the capstan back in, you see that it now clears the circuit board. So all it was was it just wasn't uh, wasn't seated. There's a little black plastic bit there, and this is a retaining clip, and it just wasn't seated. So it was never going to work basically, and that spins freely now. So happy days. So we'll resolder this back down, and then all we need to do is refit our drive belt when it arrives. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's after Christmas now, and the the post was absolutely ridiculous. But I managed to get uh, a, a belt that I believe will fit after doing some calculations. Uh, I've got a bottle of beer as well to tide me over, and it's not sponsored by them. But uh, again, deck tech, pretty good stuff, and generally they're pretty quick as well with uh, posters and whatever else. But due to Royal Mail strikes and, you know, Christmas, blah, blah, blah. Seems to have just taken ages. So I've got the transport here as well. If I just lift this up to the camera and show you. And what I've done is done my absolute best at cleaning the belts out of this. Um, some of it in there is just, it's just there. I can't get it out. I've even took the motor off. 
and it, it just basically isn't happening. So I've also uh, oiled uh, the bearings on the motors to reduce wow and flutter, which I was uh, told by a, another member should be a good idea, so I did. And then what we're going to do is, I'm going to basically uh, put the belt around the capstan, as simple as this, with one hand. And then this is going to go into the transport. <laughs> he says and then to show you the other side of why I'm doing it this way is because when I flip this over onto here the the this is the uh, the belt motor for the for the capstan so I kind of want this belt to be hanging I want it to be down the side of that chipboard there but also hanging down as you can see below I'm making a mess of this aren't I actually just give me a second let's just pop that ah that's why we're twisted we got twist there we go so I'm gonna keep that on a capstan and I'm gonna sit it on that way why is this difficult is it because I've drank half a bottle of beer with my tea Possibly. <laughs> right then, let's try again. There we go, that's where I wanted it. And now this belt, uh, we can do a bit of repositioning, but it's sitting down uh, low there. So when I flip this across, we can just stretch it over onto uh, the capstan motor, and then we can pop this smaller one onto the secondary motor. Or at least that's the plan. That is the plan. So. Basically get this lined up if I can. There's a small tab like so. And that is always we in. Let me just double check. No. Ah, that tab needs to go over there like so. Okay. So our transport holes are lined up there. These are good. Hmm. Are they good? Yeah, they're good. And on this side of the transport, we're also good. No, we're not. What's happened here? Usually I would restart the video at this point, but I'd like someone to see my uh, issues. Should we say, there we go, that's better. And the belt here is this side. I want the belt down here so we can just pop it onto the drive motor. And all of our screws are lined up. So let's get these screws in. All right, we're all screwed up and sorted and tied up now. So the the next issue I have is to get that belt up in there. If I can just get my best carbon fiber tweezers, um, I'm going to try and focus the camera first. I'm going to try and get that belt and I'm going to try and hook it onto here. Um, I don't hold that much hope to be able to do this first time. So I'm going to put the flash on the video camera to hopefully and this this transport is awfully delicate as well um i've actually had to repair some of the wires going to the heads because of the nature of it with no door protecting it it's so difficult to do things without damaging anything so uh right <laughs> focus cross your fingers here we go Yes, please. <laughs> right, that is on. Perfect. Okay, so let's ditch the flash. Yeah, so due to the fact that this transport is essentially naked, um, it's, it's so difficult to find somewhere comfortable to work on it. 
I've had to resolder uh, two of these wires down here. And of course, they're those wires that the solder doesn't like sticking to, and you've got to put a flame to them, etc. etc. So, uh, the next thing I want to do is uh, work out where this was supposed to be. Now, from online, I did see a couple of pictures that it somehow sits around here somewhere. So, I'm going to go and have a look, find a picture, and then hopefully I can stick it back on. All right, thanks for tape heads. I will put up the picture I uh, use for reference now. And as you can see, this plate uh, is, if there was a twin capstan set up on this, because the same uh, transport is used with two capstans, you would have a capstan here and you had a capstan over here. So. In order to retain this plate, I suspect last time we ever messed about with this didn't do it properly. There would be, uh, it needs to sit underneath this little plastic tab here. And then it snaps to the top and bottom of this plastic, plastic piece here. And then the spring sits on the bushing for the capstan. So that is in. Whether it'll stay in once you start moving things, I'm not entirely sure. But I believe now it's time to stick this transport back into the unit. Now the belt for the tape counter actually goes around the take-up roller, there. And once it goes inside the unit, it attaches to your tape counter roller, which is there. So, I suspect, given that there's also two grooves there for it to uh, go either side, somehow, magically, I need to sit that on there, retain it in place, and mm, yeah and then also let it sit onto the tape counter roller which seems like a stupid idea but i'm not a designer so <laughs> i'm gonna have to try and position the the transport whilst maintaining the pressure on this belt here like this i'm tempted to tape it up actually that's what i'll do i'll tape it up a little bit of redneck engineering. I've basically just taped it there, just for the fact that I've only got two hands. Um, uh, not, I've renewed the belt as well. The one that I had over there was actually the old one. But this new belt, I really aren't bothered if it's got a bit of tape residue on it, simply because it's for the tape counter. Um, so it's not controlling anything major. So hopefully I can get this positioned into the unit now, and we can start it up. And then gently... Ever so gently, I'm going to attempt to um, not block the camera and yet still produce a viable result for recording purposes, he says. I think there may be an alley. I think we're in. Are we in? We are. We're in. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna uh, go ahead, as Americans say, and uh, do up those top screws there. Mm, no, that doesn't seem right either. I'm pretty sure that these were just standard screws that came out. That's the earth. Uh, let's try this one. Just sticking the roller on. That oh, worked great, see? Sellotape. Huh. Uh, right, so it's time to get these screws in. I'm going to do this off camera because otherwise you're watching me screw screws in and that's not exciting. We're in. The easiest way to do it was to put it on its fascia and use gravity to assist with the screws. Um, what's the point of showing you me screwing screws in? So we can now uh, start plugging things back in electronically. I have repaired this far right pin of this connector which was bent and that is the connector to the heads. If I can gently 
corks that round here. And I'd like to think that will just ever so gently um, just pop into there. Now I've straightened all the pins. Like so. Excellent. There's one. And then we're going to uh, reconnect the. Uh, excuse me for my camera angles. We can hit that one in there. Um, I think that's it, actually. <laughs> um, I'm going to secure these wires out of the way a little bit. I don't like them flapping about, especially because they're attached to the heads. But uh, we've got our pulley on there. And what's quite nice, actually, if we look into the, uh, the front of the unit, and I'll just stick my torch on, you will see that there is... The, uh, the belt there from the take-up rail in its two little grooves, its little housing. So we were quite lucky with that. So I think it is time to turn it on and uh, see what happens. Now, I have a suspicion, I have a feeling that when the belt's failed on this transport, it could have been playing, it could have been fast-forwarding, I'm not entirely sure. So... Chances are this isn't in the the nothing mode, uh, and I'm hoping all the solenoids reset won't put power to it, and it'll not make any silly noises. But we'll see. I really don't want to have to take the transport out again, manually reset everything, put the belts back on, and then plug it in. So just cross your fingers. Right then, uh, I've stuck the uh, the tape holder back on, simply because I think that this will ensure that the tape is seated correctly within the transport. So, uh, we've got our favourite tape here. I'll turn it on. We've got lights, so that's good. Um, notice that the uh, the pause button flashes a couple of times, same as the Sony ones do. And we'll stick this in. And hopefully... We have rewind, tape count is working, we have fast forward, and the real test, we have play and levels, beautiful, my cat's also going crazy, you can probably hear that, um, got a little bit of dust actually, seeing as this has been sat for about two months now, yes the levels are pretty high, this, uh, this is a type 2 that I recorded and I think there's a bit of radio on the end of it as well. But our transport wars are complete and forgotten about. So now it's time to uh, calibrate the, spree, the speed even. And we can do a recording test on it. And then we'll have a look at the azimuth on the oscilloscope. So we're going to do a speed test first. I've got a, uh, some, some radio recorded and uh, it's the first time I've hooked you up to the speakers as well, so we'll... Someone out there, more adventures. Oh, be quiet. I'll get it. No, you don't know who it is. I'll get it. You should be careful. The sound's good, but it's very slow. So we'll do our speed test cassette and see what we need to adjust. The motor uh, speed adjustment on this is a pretty standard uh, hole in the back of the motor just there. There's got a rubber grommet protecting it, so you've got to kind of force your way through the rubber grommet and then you'd be able to get the, the screwdriver on the uh, adjustment nut. So that's in there now, and we'll play our speed calibration cassette and see how much it needs adjusting. So the cassette's in, I've got uh, my favourite app, Spectroid, running on a separate phone here, and uh, you're going to get a 3000 hertz tone, my screwdriver is ready to go, so you can have a little bit of a listen, and see how far out it actually is. Um, I won't talk while the tone's playing, because it'll just be annoying, but you'll see my adjustment and how it works, but it'll be very loud, I imagine, for a couple of seconds. Speed calibration tones. Come on. 3,000 hertz. 3,000 hertz. 
that's a two five seven eight so I'm going to twist this screwdriver clockwise two six two seven Uh, a little bit more of adjustment. All right, 3,000 on the nose. All right, I've stopped that just because obviously you don't need to hear the noise, but this line is our 3,000 hertz tone and uh, it's dead on the nose now. So I'll swap that cassette out and we'll have a listen to that playback of the, I think it's Radio 4 or something, and see how that sounds. Has it come? I beg your pardon. Has it come? Has it come? I'm afraid I don't follow you. You know, you must know. Well, I'm afraid we don't. I need you to help me. It's important. You say you help me. Well, of course, but I... Did you see I put a cheeky bit of music on there? Whether we'll get through the filter with that one, I don't know, but we'll see. But it sounds great. It really does. Uh, the last thing to do is to get our oscilloscope out and make sure the azimuth correction is correct and it's playing on both sides um, equally. And then we can enjoy a bit of music. We now have our uh, oscilloscope set up and I have the left channel in channel one, right channel in channel two, and we're all set up with uh, a calibrated correct test tape set in there, which was again produced on a quartz lock deck and some kind of crazy Nakamichi effort, which uh, I don't have, paid about 13 quid for it, but it's been good. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, run this through the oscilloscope and see if both channels match. I suspect one will be quieter than the other one to run this video, but because I've not touched the head azimuth, I think it'll be in spec azimuth wise. Okay, so that's playing. So as you can see, one channel is slightly louder than the other. Uh, it says there that is the left channel. And this is shown on the oscilloscope as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the left channel. The peaks aren't very uh, aren't as high as the right channel, which means that we're getting less signal out through that left-hand channel. So I'm going to adjust on the main circuit board. There is two pots. I'm going to adjust and see if we can get these levels back in balance, basically. So I'm going to display both levels at the same time, just there. I see that level's looking a bit ropey all of a sudden. It's just, just to make sure it's not the tape. Yeah, we'll adjust that and see where we get with it. But that one's obviously higher than that one, as you can see in the two there. So the pots I've got, I'm just going to double check the service manual and check, and uh, we'll adjust the left pot. So in the service manual, we have these two pots here, which is SFR 101, uh, which is there, and SFR 102, which is there. So if we scroll down the page, it'll give an explanation as to what they do. Playback sensitivity adjustment. Um, the left channel is SFR 101 and the right channel is SFR 102. So I'm going to try and uh, increase SFR 101 and see if I can get that left channel to match. So SFR 101 is the pot above where our main plug is for the heads. And as we can see here, SFR 101, which is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit a screwdriver just in it. And then, uh, in fact, we're not because it's not big enough, but we're going to play and then we're going to adjust that pot and see what it does to our oscilloscope. So I've just got a screwdriver on it there now. And if I turn it up, you'll see that the level's increased to match. So if I change the position on the oscilloscope, we are almost there matching the output signal. Um, just, if I turn it really loud there it is really loud there look I'm just going to knock it down a little bit I think we are just about matching there ok so he went off to the left a little bit there but those those two peaks are, are not matching for volume um, Strangely, the, the, this this uh, detection 
uh, our peak meters on the front don't actually show what is going on. So that is saying that the left level is a lot higher than the right level now. So I wonder, just out of sheer interest, if I change the the right pot and see what it does to this. It does turn it up to suit and match, but obviously on the oscilloscope, it is hugely different. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit of playback, uh, actually connected to the deck, and see where we get with that. Okay, so with a little bit of adjustment, uh, the measurement in the service minnow says should be getting 500 millivolts out of each channel, and we've tested it, and we're good, and both channels there, look at that, that is just about in sync as best we're going to get, I think. There's channel 1, there's channel 2, and there's 2 together. I think we're pretty good. Look at that. Azimuth is looking pretty good. I just add them two together, and we've got a nice horizontal almost uh, diagonal lines rewind the tape a little bit and there we go so this is as calibrated as I think this deck's ever going to get um, given the limitations of what I have and the volume and the tape and all the rest of the stuff so now it's just a case of having a listen and I think we're done so here we are then a bit of an end of a bit of a mission with this one uh, it needed a bit of everything I think the uh, whoever had a go at it before really complicated matters if I'm honest with you but you know sometimes you've got to deal with these things but we're here we're done everything's tested and calibrated I have some royalty free music which I've recorded so some of you may uh, recognise I'm not entirely sure but um, yeah we're all done it's cleaned up really nicely and returned the stickers so we are good to go Excellent, so all that is left to do now is to uh, fire some Chaz and Dave in because, <laughs> let's be honest, who doesn't like Chaz and Dave? Um, I personally uh, love Chaz and Dave. So I'm going to make a cup of tea, I'm going to listen to some Chaz and Dave. Thanks for watching. Um, I've got a Morant 5000, which uh, the belt's just turned up for the other day, so that's going to be a video once I get it all sorted and edited and whatnot. And, uh, yeah. Chaz and Dave it is, and a cup of tea, and have a great new year. Bye-bye.